Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon. Some say the trouble's in the street. Some say the president's a paragon. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's the anatomy. Some say the trouble's in the head. Some say the trouble's a psychology. Welcome to Human Rights Here Now. My name is Lynn Dutton. I am your host today. Today we're continuing our conversation about dying with dignity, which is particularly relevant at this time since the End of Life Action Option Act has just landed on Governor Brown's desk. Today we have three guests with us today to talk about this. We have Elena Cohen, who is a uh, action team leader for the End of Life Option Act here in Santa Cruz County. We have Rabbi Paula Marcus from Temple Bethel in Aptos. And we have our own Matilda Rand, who is the uh, producer of Human Rights Here Now. Let's start off with you, uh, Elena. If you could start telling us about the details of the act itself and what, what it is requiring of people to take a, uh, take a, to use this option. Sure. So the bill is called the End of Life Option Act, and that's singular, not plural. And the reason for that is that the bill is really designed to provide terminally ill adults who have medical decision-making capacity, one other option to exert control over their dying process. So what that means is that um, the law authorizes doctors to prescribe medication that um, will allow people to die peacefully, and it is the individual's choice about whether to take that medication um, and to determine, you know, whether they have uh, decided that their um, that their um, uh, situation and their suffering is unbearable. Uh, and this is modeled on the Oregon Act. Yes, the Oregon Act um, was uh, implemented in 1997, so they have had uh, 17 years of experience. And this bill actually includes even greater protections against some of the uh, concerns that people had about the Oregon situation. Um, however, the Oregon, um, the Oregon bill, uh, there's been really extensive documentation about how that's been working and uh, there have not been any um, reported abuses uh, in that system. Okay. Uh, you know, this is quite a change here in America, the, you know, the attitude toward being able to take a hold of an app, uh, have an option like this. You know, from what I understand, the current surveys show that 61% of the people are in favor of this option being available, though only like a 50-50 split in terms of actually voting for it or making it actually legal. Uh, so that's a change, I think, very much on you know our religious and uh, our mor sense of morality of these issues. How does the the temple view uh, th this type of an act? Uh, I know in Catholicism they're very much against any kind of thing that would be considered an act of suicide. Well, I can't really speak on behalf of the temple because. Uh Anytime you get a bunch of Jews together, you're going to have different <laughs> opinions, as you well know. Um, and the temple has not taken a position on this. And there have been some conversations among some folks, some of the members of Temple Bethel. Um, but I can say, generally speaking, that Judaism does understand that there is a time to die. It says in Ecclesiastes, which is part of the Jewish canon, et lamut, there's a time to die, a time to live and a time to die. And so there is this understanding that one's life is not finite and that there is a level of suffering that no one is expected to have to bear. And so we find examples of it in the text of, you know, rabbis who have decided it was their time in the Talmud, or we find uh, King Saul in the, also in the Jewish canon, who at a certain point in battle decided it was also time for him to die. So we do have examples of uh, Jewish sages um, coming to a place where they were undergoing such a high degree of suffering that it was time for their lives to end. And so basically um, Maimonides, who is a, a medieval um, sage and also a doctor, it turns out, he spoke about this idea that you don't, uh, it, it, when, when someone is in, under a um, great degree of duress, that you don't prevent their death. You know, you, you don't hasten death, but you also don't prevent death. So 
this idea of preserving life at whatever cost is not something that's endemic to Judaism. And there's no glorification of suffering um, within Jewish tradition either. So I think while you ask different Jews, you'll always, again, or different rabbis even, mm -hmm. you'll get different opinions. But I think the general consensus is that when extreme suffering and pain is involved, that that's the right time for someone's life to be to be over for them to decide that they're they've had enough they shouldn't be forced to have to undergo more yeah uh, a lot of the opposition to acts like this i mean there's only five states that are currently allow uh, this type of thing to happen and i'm not sure how many countries but oregon is certainly the most well known currently uh, they have not seen any great expand, any great number of people taking options, taking this particular option. Uh, I was reading online and it said like they'd only had like 105 people actually use this option as of 2010. Uh, and then there have been other people saying that, uh, I believe it was Rick Santorum was basically saying that, you know, in the Netherlands that uh, they had old people wearing bracelets saying, uh, do not, you know, do not, do not kill me or something like that, uh, which, you know, according to the statistics I've seen, uh, that isn't an issue with this act. What are the precautions within the act to keep people from being coerced? Uh, the, you know, there's varieties of different types of coercion, uh, but what, what, what does the act actually uh, talk about? Well, I'm happy to talk about some of those protections, but I would like to clarify some okay. of the um, some of the misunderstandings about um, religious positions and views concerning the term suicide and assisted suicide. So, um, certainly, the uh, the Catholic Church uh, does not support this kind of position. There are several um, Catholic. Uh, theologists and Catholic legislators and Catholic individuals who believe that um, uh, this kind of option is consistent with their faith. Um, and the same is true of, of several other religious organizations and individuals. And there is a list uh, of, the, of the organizations that support this bill uh, that do include religious leaders. And, and um, the, the really important aspect about the religious perspective is that um, the bill is designed to address the concerns of the particular individual and how that individual um, with the input of uh, the, their religious uh, leaders and their family and their loved one and their values, how, how they view it. Um, secondly, um, the, the issue about the term uh, suicide and assisted suicide is something that um, the, the literature has found really confuses um, the issues at hand. There was a survey in 2014 where um, people were asked, do you think that uh, terminally ill individuals should be able to have this right? And um, the, the result was something like 75% mm, thought that they okay. should. And then if, you, if the same people were asked the question, do you think that um, uh, terminally ill individuals should be able to um, have doctors assist in their suicide, then uh, it went down to 59%. Mm -hmm. So um, the real issue is, and, and by the way, as a, as a legal matter in the bill, it, it's clear that this is not considered a suicide or assisted suicide. So the reason that the issue of suicide comes up is because of the social stigma and the possible religious implications. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's really important to, to try to, to tease that out of this um, discussion and, um, and understand that many of these people who are terminally ill have done absolutely everything to try to prolong their life. And, and one of the um, really um, uh, strong advocates for this bill who died recently said, um, you know, I've done everything to extend my life. Please don't extend my dying. So um, those are just some clarifications. And by the way, in, um, in California, uh, the um, surveys show that the, that the support for this kind of bill is up to about 75% oh, okay. uh, among every demographic, I mean, every demographic, including uh, Catholics and Latinos and African Americans, old, new, um, old, young men, women. So, um, so now, now to the protections. So um, it is, as you pointed out, it's based on the Oregon law. Um, and then there's been some uh, additional protections to, pro to protect against coercion. So um, it's, uh, it, it's both 
to protect against coercion, and also to make sure that the individual is really fully informed and has the capacity to understand the risks and benefits and alternatives and can communicate that decision. So um, the, there has to be uh, two independent doctors have to determine that the patient is terminally ill, that means uh, death within six months, um, and also the physicians have to um, uh, be comfortable that the patient does have this medical decision-making capacity and give the patient um, several uh, other options about end-of-life care, including hospice, palliative care, um, those, uh, those discussions and the patient's request to have the prescription uh, have to take place uh, 15 days apart. Um, and then uh, additional protection was added that once the medication has been provided, the patient again has to sign something. Um, there, are the, there are witnessing requirements um, that are consistent with a lot of other kind of healthcare consents like advanced directives and making sure that the witnesses don't have uh, particular conflicts. Um, the physician also has to be able to speak with the patient privately without anybody else present to mm -hmm. ensure that there's no coercion. Um, and also if there's any concern that the patient um, is, uh, has a, um, uh, a, a mental disorder that would prohibit that person from being able to make an informed decision um, and you know, have the judgment clouded, then there's a reference to counseling for that and a determination on that. Finally, um, the uh, disability or age cannot by itself be considered a terminal illness. Mm. And when I say finally, there are probably many other uh, <laughs> protections, but those are some of the main ones. Now, uh, I, I want to yes. respond to that because you know what you're what you're saying is um, basic, basically the same as it is in the Netherlands. And you know, I'm really surprised. And, and I think after I'm done talking, uh, I think I'll have debunked what Rick Santorum is talking about. People <laughs> saying I don't know. Um, my sister, who had ovarian cancer, who did everything she could, right from the beginning, when she was told that she probably wouldn't have more than two years to live, she started with her personal physician. It has to be a physician that n n who knows. The, the patient. It can't be just any physician. It has to be a person who, who uh, you know, your, your regular family physician. So she, every time she went to the doctor, she had to repeat, you know, the doctor would ask, what is the status of this? And then write in the medical record, I want euthanasia if my, they called euthanasia, uh, if my, my suffering becomes unbearable. So from the beginning in 2010, she, 2010, 2011, she said that. And every time she had to say it again. Then she did the treatment. But for her, she told me, what, what it meant for her was that I can live my life. I can take the risk of these treatments because I know if these treatments have terrible side effects or really are, you know, in the end killing me, I have this option out of life where I'm guaranteed that within five minutes, you know, of course, filling out the papers and all that, but within five minutes, she would be dead. She said that was such an incredible relief. So what she did was she took the treatment. Then she went four months to Australia. It came back and they told her it comes back. So then she did another three, four months of treatment. She went to, to London, to Paris, to, and then it came back one more time. And the treatments had worked really, really well for her. So she actually had some glimmer of hope that maybe she never had to use the end of life option, but she had it. And so she went on these trips and then she got it back. The treatment didn't work. In the meantime, her lungs, around her lungs, her cavity filled up with fluid, mm -hmm. which she expressed to me in March of 2013 of so unbearable. She said, I was ready to do it right then and there. But they decided that they could extract the fluid. It appeared to work to a certain extent. And she said, I think it's time for you to come. 
you know, I'd ask her, do you want me to come? No, 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 wait, 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 because she was hoping, hoping, hoping. So in the end, um, when I arrived in March of 2013, she was in the hospital and they did more extractions. But of course, they had side effects. The, the, the fluid in the, the, you know, the, her lungs had made sections. And so it was, if they would extract more fluid, what would happen was that the rest of her lung would collapse. Yeah. So she basically stopped the chemotherapy because it wasn't working anymore. It was actually doing more harm. And she then still knew I have this end of life option. She saw all of us several more times and she started preparing for her own celebration of life and a funeral. And, and then she had to meet this other doctor. So she had met with her family physician. Now it was time to meet this other doctor who was, had no connection with And she had to say to the doctor what she wanted, you know, reinforce. So I was there with my sister visiting her. And she said to me, I have to tell this other doctor that I want. And she looked around and that I want. And she couldn't come up with the word. And so we gave her the word. It was the word euthanasia. And so she said, well, I, I better remember. I better practice this word because that's what I want. So we all laughed. We had a good time. But it was kind of bittersweet because we knew it was coming. And so she, in the end, did the euthanasia. And it was a beautiful, beautiful get together. She, came, she got together with her husband for last lunch, uh, her, her friend and, and the, the friend's husband and the sister of a husband. So she had support people for everyone. The five of them had lunch. Then the doctor came. In the Netherlands, it's a little different. The doctor came with all the, the pills and, and more. And so the doctor gave her the pills. And her husband described to us what happened. He was there. And uh, just the three of them, the doctor, my sister, and her husband. And he said, if for any reason the pills didn't work, the doctor was allowed in the Netherlands. And I know we don't have that in, in ours, in the California. But the doctor was allowed to give her something else. To in, I'm not sure if it was an injection or anything else, to guarantee that she would have a peaceful death. Mm -hmm. And it was. The pills worked, so it was. And so to me, to my family, to my sister, it was such an incredible experience. We celebrated her life while she was alive. She fought extremely hard. But that option gave her the impetus of really getting everything out of life she could. And so, and that is what I feel California is doing. And I read, you know, this morning again, I read the, um, the, the protective measures. And, and they're similar, and they're very, they're, they're very solid. I mean, things have to be in writing. And the doctor has to meet privately with the, with the patient, not anybody else there. Nobody can feed him any information. And if the doctor has any inkling that, you know, in the, in the conversation, that the person is under duress from other people, either because of the money or, you know, the, the, the hardship, then the, the, the patient gets referred to a mental health professional. And so I, I read the same thing. And of course, in the Netherlands, this has been happening way longer than even in Oregon. And it's working. And I have never heard of anybody running around. Because there is no, no way that a doctor can decide to give an injection and bye-bye, here you go. It's a person who decides. So I'm not sure what. Yeah, so I, I think that the, thank you so much for sh sharing all of uh -huh. that. Um, the uh, two really important points. One is that the uh, people who have opposed this, these options in the United States keep on talking about what's, what's happening in other countries. And you know, the fact remains that um, since this first law was passed in Oregon, there have not been these um, concerns raised about how it's going to be 
um, the, you know, the slippery slope of what, mm -hmm. what else is going to be happening. And you know, as you know, we, we don't authorize euthanasia or somebody else to inject. Um, and I really encourage people to, uh, if they, if they want to see some um, experience of how it's working in Oregon, there's really a wonderful documentary called mm -hmm. um, How to Die in Oregon. We have a link to that. And, and it really um, communicates, I think, very effectively um, the level of um, emotional freedom mm -hmm. that uh, both the individual patient and the families uh, can feel. And I think that um, uh, if you uh, compare what happened with Brittany Maynard in Oregon and what happened to Jennifer Glass here, um, it really does provide a stark mm -hmm. different experiences. And, and I'm happy to go into that if yeah. you want. Yeah. Tim, I, Tim, just one piece about yeah. this. I, I think what's most important in my mind about all of this is that it's inspiring people to have these conversations with their family members. I mean, you, you and your sister were clear. She was clear with your family. Yeah. And in my thinking, and I think in a lot of people's thinking, these are topics that folks don't want to talk about. What, you know, we don't imagine our own death, really, in, in, in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so to have this conversation among family members and to be really clear about what your values are and when you feel like you know you want to uh, what what's your quality of life what do you feel like is your bottom line and it's very encouraging to me i think that atul gawande's book being mortal and the pbs special that was on uh... for a while raises these issues that folks you know haven't been talking about and you know, and now we're, as we get older, <laughs> and uh, the baby boomers are aging, and as I heard someone say, we don't do anything quietly. <laughs> um, this is going to be what we're going to be talking about, and I think it's really healthy because you don't ever want to be in a position where things happen to you at the end of your life. You want to be able to say, these are my values. And Gawande talks about a guy who, you know, the only thing that he really felt like he wanted to have to be able to do at the end of his life was sit in his chair and eat chocolate ice cream and watch <laughs> the ball game. That was quality of life for him. So I think it's up to each of us to spend some time discerning what does it mean for us to have some quality of life and when are we done? Mm -hmm. When are we finished? When is the time to, you know, to say, okay, enough is enough? And mm -hmm. I think that's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. it, well, and, and an interesting side effect of what's happened in Oregon is that it has also improved communication between the patient and healthcare providers and the family members um, about even already existing other legal options. Uh, Brittany Maynard uh, communicated and, and uh, her husband communicated that the level of information they got about other end-of-life mm -hmm. options mm -hmm. was so much clearer and, and detailed in Oregon than it was in New York. And Christy O'Donnell, who is another um, terminally ill advocate in California, um, who has uh, her mother uh, took advantage of the Oregon law, and the and she has said that the difference in the um, ability to communicate about other end of life options uh, has just made uh, it's just so much more uh, thorough and helpful mm -hmm. when family members and uh, healthcare providers don't feel that they are operate under under the cloud of possibly going to jail. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and the, the thing also is that, uh, and I know we have some slides on that, but when I went into a Dominican to have surgery, I filled out a, a booklet called Five Wishes. And uh, the Five Wishes, I mean, you just basically, uh, different categories say what you would want if anything would happen. Of course, nothing happened. Here mm -hmm. I am. They did a fantastic job. But it made me feel that they would take care of me if anything happened about the feeding, you know, the yes blood, no blood, whatever I wanted, I could put in there. And the other one is that my doctor has given me several years ago, and I, I update it every once in a while, is the advance directive. And that's also very popular in the conversation these days between doctor and patient. There's just this clarity. And then the final one, which is, I believe, 2013, 2014, established in California, is the POLS, which is the Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. 
and the poles, which is, uh, has a special color, it has pink. So that goes with the patient, that would go with me if I go from, from my surgery to my room and let's say I have to go to my nursing home. And so it would go with me and it, made it makes it so much easier also for nurses and doctors who don't know you because it is under the supervision of, of a physician that it's been uh, set up. And so when it goes with me from, from place to place, it makes it so much easier for the, for the nurses and the doctors to make decisions for me if I'm not there and I don't have my advocate there. It's always great to have an advocate, mm. but let's say, you know, I mean, people go home and need to feed the dog or whatever it is. They need to do different things in their lives. They can't always be with me and be my advocate, but the pulse would go with me you know, in my, my final uh, six months. And so I, I think we already have, even, even in those states where there isn't an end of life option act, there is already so much more conversation. And so, do you want to say something about the Conversation Project? Yes, um, so the Conversation Project it was a project that was started by Ellen Goodman, who is a columnist, and she uh, worked on this with um, other healthcare providers and uh, religious leaders and uh, medical ethicists to uh, try to give people tools for starting the discussion and having the discussion about end-of-life care. Mm -hmm. And um, it really has some really helpful, practical tools about how to start this conversation. It's, it's important to note also, however, that I mean these advanced directives are really important and really helpful. Um, the End-of-Life Option Act does not allow people to ask in advance right. to be able to take advantage of this. You can't say in your advance directive, if I am terminally ill and I don't have decision-making capacity, I want you to give me this. You have to be able to make mm -hmm. that request um, in person, and that is you know, one of the safeguards that people have had. Um, and sort of speaking from an opposition position, the slippery slope is the, is the thing that tends to come to my mind because I, I guess maybe I'm a little bit cynical about human nature, be it uh, corporations or just relatives when money is involved, is that if they find a way to game the system, they will. Uh, I guess the, the main thing that comes to my mind is how the BMW recently gamed the, the emission system by basically making the cars smart enough to lie. Uh, but in, And the same thing for with uh, insurance companies, whether they have a vested interest in people selecting such an option or uh, you know, family members, you know, subtly, if not, uh, you know, sub rosa, uh, pushing the idea that this would be a better thing for the, for, the parent or for the parent or the loved one to do just to take care of the family situation or people just in a lower economic class that do not necessarily have the same uh, access to the uh, health care that they would want to have. Uh, these are all areas where I could see, you know, people taking advantage of this act because they had no other choice uh, at that point. Uh, is there any kind of reporting requirements mm -hmm. in the act for the doctors to let, you know, let people know within, within the California Act? I believe it's already in the Oregon Act, but I, mm -hmm. I you know, once again in my uh, reading on the, on the web was that it seemed to me, it seemed to indicate that there wasn't a reporting uh, requirement on the physicians to actually talk about this or reported into state information? Um, well, I, I don't actually think that is accurate. There, is, there, there will be documentation yeah. similar to what's happening in Oregon. So, so first of all, it's really important to remember that both the um, proponents and the opponents of the End of Life Option Act don't want individuals to be coerced on this. Mm -hmm. One of the, I mean, the, the, the keystone of this particular um, act is to um, is for individuals to be able to have um, their own wishes honored and to be and to exert control. Now, um, so you talked about several potentially yeah. um, uh, unethical uh, areas of unethical behavior. So first, let's talk about family members. Well, now as a practical matter, any time you are talking about an individual dying. Usually, the people closest to that person 
are most likely going to be able to uh, are going to be be benefiting um, financially. And so we have a whole system already in place about safeguards to try to prevent abuses. Mm -hmm. And the kind of um, safeguards that we have um, in the End of Life Option Act are the kind of safeguards that we have related to wills and that we have related to advanced directives. And so it's really, it's very consistent with um, addressing these kind of issues in, uh, in the rest of our, of our legal system and our, and our medical system. Um, when you're talking about um, people uh, who are in, uh, who don't have access to health care, um, they, certainly in Oregon, um, they have found that this, um, the people who have taken advantage of this, and by the way, it, uh, over the 17 years, I think it's more like uh, 1,500 people okay. have actually gotten the mm -hmm. me medication and about half of them have actually taken it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they found that uh, the people who are taking advantage of this are actually not people um, the, who are in, um, who, who generally don't have access to health care. They tend to be people who are in the higher incomes. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're talking about insurance companies, mm -hmm. um, there was actually an, an interesting study in the New England Journal of Medicine that was co-authored by somebody who was uh, against uh, this type of option. Um, and, and he actually concluded with the other authors that it didn't actually even end up saving that much money for the healthcare <laughs> system. And so, and then in, and then um, our, bill in um, California has additional safeguards that they didn't even have in, um, in Oregon, um, including that um, a, an insurance company cannot bring up the option of end-of-life care uh, in terms of the coverage unless either the individual or the health care provider requests it. And when they are giving their um, coverage notices, um, they can't do what initially happened in Oregon. I don't. I think they may have changed it, where mm -hmm. they would say, "We are not going to provide a certain kind of treatment um, because it is ineffective." However, we will give you. <laughs> we will cover this. Um, and some people think that that was because um, that that people were being sort of forced to pick the cheapest option. Yeah. It really had to do with whether the other treatment was effective, effective. Or, or ineffective. Hmm. Okay, um, let's sort of shift the conversation to talking about the conversation. Uh, you know, my wife and I have uh, done a living trust where we went through our lawyer and we've set things up, you know, both legally for in terms of inheritance, but also there was extensive sort of what are the different possibilities of situations, who's going to take care of uh, medical decisions, financial decisions, am I capable of making a decision? Am I not capable of making a decision? Uh, so, we, you know, I've already had that conversation, but it's not, as you stated earlier, it's not an easy conversation to start. And how do you start having this conversation with people that don't want to, but probably should have this conversation? Well, everybody should. So, I mean, probably should. We were talking earlier, uh, Elena and I, about we think of people who are older, that they should be having these conversations. But unfortunately, as we know, things happen that are unexpected, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, someone who's in their mid-20s can, you know, have an accident. And then they're in a position where maybe they can't communicate or we don't know their wishes. Or so I was saying that um, Hospice of Santa Cruz is going over to Cabrillo College to do an advanced healthcare directive workshop mm. planning, you know, so with, with students. So it's never too early is kind of what I have to say. And what people don't always realize is you have to revisit these decisions as your circumstances change. So get the ball rolling and start having these conversations. And I understand this because um, in my family, it's not always been easy to have these conversations. So I really understand it. On the other hand, um, in my family, my husband had a sudden cardiac arrest in his doctor's office. Mm. And uh, that was six years ago. And so it was very, very helpful that he and I had already been talking about, well, you know, as we get older, what are the things that are most important to us? What are the, what's the quality of life that we feel like is the most uh, poignant for us that we're at a point where we don't want to say, okay, I want to keep going with this. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the, uh, 
what I have said to my congregation, because I spoke about this on Yom Kippur, is I'm here to help you have these conversations. And in fact, there's a member of the synagogue and I who are planning to do some workshops at Temple Bethel for members of the synagogue to help them start having these conversations. And we'll probably use some of the information from the uh, link that Elena mentioned earlier about the conversation and other materials that hospice has provided. So I would encourage other um, communities, whether they be faith communities or you know all kinds of circles of friendship where you have meetings, book clubs, whatever, you, whatever it is, the people you're connected with, to start talking about how can we do this as uh, together or mm -hmm. how can we do this with our families to support each other. I guess that's what I'm trying to, to mm -hmm. lift up is that, you know, ask each other, what, what did you do to start this conversation with your family? What worked mm -hmm. for you? What was difficult for you? I've had over the years many people come to me and ask me, is it okay according to Judaism to not put in a feeding tube, for instance? You know, my personal story is my grandfather, um, my grandmother made a decision for my grandfather to have a feeding tube inserted in, you know, for him. And they'd been married for 72 years, and she was really afraid of what it was going to be like when he died. And he really did want to die, but they hadn't talked about it beforehand, mm. right? So it's very, it was very painful. The idea of removing the feeding tube was just too painful in those circumstances, although some people choose to do that as well. And I'm not making any judgments about that. I'm just saying in that circumstance, that wasn't going to happen. When it came to my grandmother, and she'd been to the hospital a number of times before she died, she was very, very clear that she didn't want to keep going back to the hospital. So my mom and I went to hospice and filled out the paperwork with her and she didn't have to go back to the hospital again. So I think some of us have learned about the value of this conversation through personal experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, everyone so far that I've spoken to has had some kind of story yeah. mm -hmm. I've got to tell you about hospice or like the story that you shared so beautifully with us, Matilda, um, to say this is why this is so important. So if you don't have a story, Ask yeah. your friends. They do. <laughs> they right? Ask your family members. We, yeah, and, and they do. We all have when, a story of some sort. Yeah. And then and also, you know, what, what you're mentioning, after my sister passed away, it was, for me, so much easier to talk about it with my friends. I mean, I tell the story. I, I, I tell it on, on TV because it is a genuine human story and a life affirming. See, that's the interesting thing. It's a life affirming decision that my sister made. It was for her during the time that she still lived, but also it's for us a life affirming because the fact that I now have said, this is what I want, I can live freely within, I don't have to, I'm not afraid. And I know what I want and my friends and my family know what mm -hmm. I want. So I can live my life, not recklessly, but I can live my life. Mm. Yeah, well, I was um, in the 1980s, I was a staff attorney in New York for a national organization called the Society for the Right to Die. And in those days, the big issue was, um, can we get advanced directives uh, to be legally clear, clearly legally authorized in all of these different states. Well, of course, now we've gotten, um, it's really become uh, a very standard part of uh, estate planning, mm -hmm. actually. So, um, but in those days when people would say, how do you start these conversations? Mm -hmm. and, and what I'd say is, I'd say, well, it's, it's, it's like insurance. You know, when you buy uh, fire insurance or earthquake insurance or anything like that, and you think about, your house being completely destroyed, it's really upsetting, but you do it and then you can forget about it. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage people to look at it like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the other thing that I think is a lot easier now than it was then is I also encourage people to, uh, if they felt comfortable, um, videotape their conversations. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. it's so easy with phones, phones and things like <laughs> that. And, and it also can give people peace of mind yeah. when they, you know, in times of stress, when they may say, you know, did I, did I remember that right? Um, you know, you can go back to the, right. video go tape. back to the videotape. Go back to the right. tape, yeah. instant replay. And, and I think, not to underestimate what Matilda's saying about families knowing, because the last thing that anybody wants is for children to be fighting about what their parents would have wanted. Hmm. I mean, that to me is kind of the bottom line. It's yeah. like, do you want your family to be torn up, God forbid, about making decisions for you that you, don't, you haven't been clear about? It, you, want your, you want your kids and your family members to get along, 
at that stressful, difficult time. It, it, it can be think, very devastating exactly. to, to and children. Exactly. So and you want that. And the other thing I think that's really interesting is that the Advanced Healthcare Directive talks also about what do you want to have happen after you die. Yeah. And Matilda spoke about that so beautifully when referring to your sister. It's like, I don't want to be cremated. I do want to be cremated. Mm -hmm. I want a funeral that looks like this. I want, don't want this to happen. Nobody should be singing X, Y, Z or, you know, <laughs> thinking I would want that. But I, I mean, I think it opens up yeah. all kinds of decisions that people can make, not just how do I want to die if I'm, you know, if I'm able to make that choice now, this is what I would like, but also what happens after and what are my, what are my best wishes for my family that survives me? That's really important. What, one of the ways this conversation can get started that I've heard about is that my sister-in-law, who lives in Eugene, Oregon, she's been doing uh, something they call a death cafe. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, I, I don't know whether true. you've heard of this or not, but where you go to a cafe and you just sort of set up and have a conversation with people about these issues. Uh, I'm not quite sure how it works. I don't recall how she said she did that, but it just sounded like, uh, it sounds a bit strange, tell the <laughs> truth, but, but uh, you know, it sounds like at least one way of getting it started. And certainly, in, you know, I guess Oregon is a place where this conversation is at least more out in the open than it is here in, uh, in California. But they're mm -hmm. happening in Santa Cruz. Oh, are I, they now? I know somebody from Temple Bethel and from Chadesh Yimenu, another Jewish community in town. Um, who's been, you know, participating in death cafes already. How, so it, how, it is happening. Do you know how they, they're set up? Well, you know, I know. I know that it's people who come together. I don't know if it's always in a cafe. I think they do it in people's homes also. Oh, okay. But it's, it, that word cafe kind of <laughs> adds, it makes it normal. It's kind of what mm -hmm. I, I think is the idea behind it, not knowing a lot about it, but the idea that we can have this conversation in a cafe. We can have this conversation while we're sitting around and, you know, over a cup of coffee or a cup of tea that this, we're reclaiming and we're really striving, we're aspiring, I guess that's mm -hmm. the word, to make this conversation something that can happen under normal circumstances, that it doesn't have to be scary or gloomy or, you know, signs of doom, that we want to, norm, we want to normalize this conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the idea behind the death cafes is that we want to make this something that can happen mm -hmm. in your living room. It's something that is so, um, supported and so important and you know how do we get to that place where we just say okay death is a part of life and because guess what every all, one of us we all right? get there eventually exactly. you know and the interesting thing is though you know I can I can imagine because it, in a way it has happened to me but in in those conversations that people have it actually brings also the community that's community closer together yes so you know you're saying death is part of life and and it also can contribute us to live our life in a way that we really want to live i mean it also makes us think about what do i want out of life right that's correct and i think that if you sit in a circle about you know what do i want when i'm dying it also you know inversely says what do i want while i'm alive here absolutely and it and i think the idea that we all have our vulnerabilities and isn't death kind of the symbol of vulnerability, that we all have our vulnerabilities? When you're talking about bringing a community together, I mean, this is one of the reasons why every Yom Kippur I talk about death, because I think it helps communities come together and acknowledge the truth of our lives, like you're saying, mm -hmm. and then be able to say, okay, so this is on the table. How do we, how do we want to live, like you say, and how do we discuss that our lives are finite and what does that mean to us that our lives are finite it elevates that idea that every one of us has vulnerable moments and i think that's really really important to have the opportunity because in our normal lives we don't think about death at all right i mean no. who who does right until one of our friends dies or is dying yeah. is facing you know a serious illness and so the idea that we could have these conversations and be able to maintain uh, this this reality that we don't have it before our face every day. I don't live every day thinking about death, but yet when it becomes more and more normalized, mm -hmm. then we can share in this and support each other, I guess, in thinking about these important values. So it's I think it is helpful to bring communities together to talk yeah. about these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in terms of um, uh, different uh, places where we can find information about uh, the conversation or the five wishes and so forth. Where on, do you know the the websites that we can reference on those? 
Yes, I think most of them have been um, included, uh, will be included at, at the end of the show. Um, the organizations that have helpful information for California is uh, actually the um, the Attorney General's office uh, has an end-of-life care website uh, that has some information. Uh, Hospice of Santa Cruz County has information. Um, Compassion and Choices is a national organization, um, but they have information specifically about California. Um, and then there's the Ellen Goodman's conversation. And uh, Atul Gawande's book um, and his writing, I think, is just writing. wonderful. Yeah. Um, and um, so I think those are definitely good places to, uh, to start. There's also an organization called um, something like Coalition for Compassionate Care. I have the website up there too, which is different than uh, C Compassion and Choices that, that also um, uh, gives opportunities for um, being able to have these kinds of discussions. And I'm sorry, w one other yeah, thing is just that um, uh, many of you may recall the, uh, the uh, in an earlier election, the discussion about uh, the death panels yeah. that uh, mm. uh, oh, yeah. was um, was very distorted. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to report that um, now both um, it is a, a bipartisan bill in Congress and a potentially um, um, uh, regulations um, from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services are now going to, um, they're talking about um, reimbursing healthcare providers for their end of life discussions with patients. Mm. And um, that I think will uh, encourage healthcare providers to speak more and, and you know, far from it being a death panel, it's really an opportunity for people to talk about their end of life preferences and that can include um, asking for all the um, all the treatment, so um, we hope that the, that will be forthcoming too. You know, Andy, um, you you send me uh, several. You know, I ask you for more information because you have been you know with this for longer than I have, and so you send me this link from the assembly uh, woman uh, Susan Talamantes Eggman, mm -hmm. and so I watched that this morning on uh, the assembly. Uh, so assembly TV or something like that. She was so eloquent. Yeah. She too came from a personal experience. And when she became an assembly member, she really articulated in a way where I can imagine she convinced, uh, not persuaded, but convinced of the righteousness of this movement and the request of the end of life option. Um, so I highly recommend that people, well, it was just like six minutes, yeah, was, she was speaking to her colleagues in the assembly. Mm -hmm. Right, it was when she introduced the, the um, AB, uh, uh, AB 2X15, right? right? And it was truly amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think we have, you know, not only do we have, I mean, I, I feel my, my community is expanding. Because through this, I mean, I wouldn't have sat here with the two of you, and I would not have, you know, get to know her. I never heard of this assembly member. I'm also very pleased with um, our assembly member, Mark Stone, and our Senator Bill Monning, who, from the beginning, and of course, uh, assembly member Alejo uh, also, right from the beginning, they were co sponsors of uh, uh, assembly member Eggman's. Uh, proposal. Um, I, f I feel my, my community is expanding because we're talking about life and life choices, both while we're alive and also when we're dying. And I, I feel enriched, actually, mm -hmm. which sounds strange. Well, and, and I think that um, your experience is also consistent with some of the changes in the medical community. Mm -hmm. The California Medical Association um, uh, abandoned its long-standing opposition mm -hmm. right. to the End of Life Option Act and realized that there are situations where um, we cannot stop people's suffering. Mm -hmm. And and also um, uh, one of the national hospice organizations also uh, has taken a neutral position on um, the End of Life Option. And so I think what that what that shows us, and is also one other thing, is that the Institute of Medicine 
um, came out with a report in 2014 um, that was a bipartisan uh, panel that uh, said we really have to overhaul how we are dealing with end of life issues because we are spending, we are doing too much for people when it's not effective and when they don't want it. Mm -hmm. And so part of this uh, desire to have a conversation and to communicate is to, um, to actually uh, do what people want. And right. that may be to have less care and it may be to um, help their, um, their dying process um, so that they're, when they're terminally ill, rather than them spending time worrying about all of the awful thing that's going to that is going to happen to them, they can focus on how they want to live the rest of their lives, mm -hmm. how they want their loved ones to remember them. Mm -hmm. And once again, when you compare um, what happened with Brittany Maynard and Jennifer Glass, it's really quite profound. Brittany, although unfortunately she had to move to Oregon, which had all sorts of you know just amazing stresses, she, she was able to time her death. She was able to um, say goodbye to her loved ones and uh, take the medication and die peacefully. And Jennifer Glass, who had been just a tireless advocate from the beginning of when um, the first uh, uh, version of this bill was introduced uh, at the beginning of January, you know, she so desperately wanted to be able to have the kind of experience that that um, Brittany had, and instead she um, she chose to have um, palliative sedation, which oftentimes can work well for terminally ill people. For her, um, uh, it was a it was a five day ordeal where it was just terribly traumatic for her family and for her. She woke up. Um, in a panic uh, a few times mm. from the sedation and ultimately you know she um, drowned in her own bodily fluids and it mm. was exactly the kind of death that she really didn't want and and it's exactly what my sister prevented right exactly with you know with the communication and the life you know she still had at the end that's that was going to be her death that's right. and she knew it and so she uh, I know she postponed it one week uh, her husband, he wasn't ready yet, so mm -hmm. he said, I asked her if she could postpone it for a little while, and she did. She postponed it one week, mm -hmm. and, you know, it was good. Now, I don't know how much time we have, but I remember you talking to us when we spoke previously about something I thought was kind of a, an, an opportunity within uh, the, the faith community about uh, what you called the principle of a double double effect or something that that the uh, I, I thought that was so powerful that you know the <laughs> intent to do something that is all right within your religious belief to relieve the pain if it has the unintended side effect of you know earlier death there's yeah, I think that was from the Catholic perspective, actually. Was I it? Think someone yeah, else that was, yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned that. Yes. Okay, yes. I and, we, and, I heard um, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, that, no, I mean, I, I thought you mentioned what you mentioned. Yeah, that, that's but right. I thought and, that was fascinating. That yeah, and, and um, what happened is that, that those situations would come up when um, somebody would have, uh, let's say, um, you were talking about um, sedating a patient um, to to help them avoid pain and if at the same time it ends up shortening their life even though that was not the intention um, then that um, that could be permissible okay. um, and that that was the the general concept uh, that I, I believe was um, was a part of the uh, the Catholic tradition okay. um, once again one of the um, one of the really important aspects about legalizing um, the end of life option act the, the end of life option is that people don't if it's not part of their own religious perspective they also don't have to be worrying even from the medical ethical or the legal perspective of what their intent was um, in a situation like this if you're um, if you want your dying process to be um, to be um, peaceful, peaceful. Um, you you don't have to be 
sort of walking this fine line of, well, are you intending to shorten the person's life or not? That, that's really not, uh, not really that's an good. issue yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was we're, fascinating. We're quickly yeah. coming to the end of our time. But I do have a question. This is that right, a, at, right it, at this. I hope this is not a pun intended, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> not a pun as far intended. as we know. As far as we know. Uh, the bill is, hasn't been signed yet. Do we have an indica indication of which way Governor Brown's going to go on this? I don't think we do have an indication. He has not uh, said anything publicly. Um, he has, uh, his office has uh, shared um, that. He spoke with Brittany Maynard mm -hmm. when she was alive, and she actually provided videotaped testimony before she died, asking for this bill to be passed. Um, he um, he has. I, I think people have also felt that uh, whatever decision he makes, uh, it will be on the merits of the bill and not issues relating to uh, any sort of process on it. And um, we know that Governor Brown has his. Uh, uh, his own ways of um, of making decisions. We know that uh, he values uh, individual autonomy, and we hope that he um, understands that this bill is actually um, sort of religiously neutral in that um, it allows people to do what's consistent with their own views, and it doesn't force anybody to do anything that is not consistent with those. What, what my last question is, what if he vetoes it? What happens at that point? Well, okay, so if, he, if either he signs it or um, he doesn't sign it, uh, then it will become law. If he vetoes it, most likely what's going to happen is that um, Compassion and Choices uh, will be um, uh, trying to put together a, a ballot initiative. Ballot. And, and if, if, if he signs it or not sign it, which means it becomes law, and that's then October it becomes law in, in, in January? It, probably, I think it's in the beginning of 2016. I'm not sure the exact date. Well, I want to I wanna thank you and Rabbi Paula and Matilda for being with us today. Uh, this conversation will obviously continue uh, for all of us uh, as we approach these issues and uh, we will carry on and maybe talk and have these conversations either at a death cafe or just among our families. Uh, though I don't think that my 24-year-old children are wanting to talk about it at this point in time. <laughs> so this is Lynn Dutton for Human Rights Here Now. Thank you and tune in again next time we get together. Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon, some say the trouble's in the street, some say the president's a paragon, where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's the anatomy, some say the trouble's in the head, some say the trouble's the psychology, where's the trouble at the bottom? Trouble, trouble, where's the trouble? Oh mama, where's the trouble? Got a headache, seeing double. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Trouble, trouble, where's the trouble? Oh mama, where's the trouble? Got a headache, seeing double. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's with the principal. Some say the trouble's with the kids. Some say the trouble's the curriculum. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's in the textbook. Some say the trouble's in the class. Oh, all the school board fucking up where's the trouble at the bottom trouble trouble where's the trouble oh mama where's the trouble got a headache seeing double where's the trouble at the bottom trouble trouble where's the trouble oh mama where's the trouble got a headache seeing double where's the trouble at the bottom